Live streaming is on. Hello, world. My name is Jerry Fialka. And I am honored and have a big pleasure in my heart for Clinton Ignat Ignatov, who's with me here for McLuhan Mashup Number Four, December 27, 2020 Vision. Clinton, it's great to see you. The first question is Frank Zappa, who turned 80 just December 21, six days ago, said, Who are the brain police? If you were rewording that, you would say, who are the blank police? What would you fill that in with? Panopticon. Terrible word. What does that word mean? And before you tell us, Clint, keep it in layperson's terms. We're going to go into the word layperson. But, you know, you've got a deep vocabulary in Many sciences, literature, computer. Try to tell it to the lay person because that's who I am. I'm a lay person. I'm laid back. <laughs> that's uh, I think it was a uh, Jeremy Bent. So, some theorist a couple hundred years ago invented a prison that was watched over by a central guard tower that was sort of shrouded in the darkness, and all the cells surrounded the tower. And no prisoner knew if they were being watched or not. So as a prisoner in this in this prison, um, you uh, you always acted as though you were being watched because you never knew if from out of the shadows of the central dark tower, someone was looking at you right now. And its design for this prison was called the Panopticon. And then I guess a few decades ago, the word sort of made a comeback when... Um, Michel Foucault, a French theorist, sort of described people having brain police installed in their heads by by contemporary society watching over them, uh, given that sense that you could always at some point be being surveilled, right? They're living in, in your head, right? Very good. That was really layperson e ish in panoptic. That's you brought up two two words I love: not knowing, and um. I think the process of moving forward in attaining knowledge, which you're my hero at, you attain so much knowledge and then you you share it in so many ways. And so your your uh, essay on explorations and your videos in helping me. But how do you, uh, Clinton, process this not knowing or unlearning? Well, that's the thing. Um, most learning is basically getting a hint of something that you're never that you understand that you're probably never going to have the the time to revisit. Um, so, actually, what you're doing, I f I feel like if you were to learn the name of every mountain that you're never going to actually climb, then uh, you're going to learn a whole lot of geography. But uh, it doesn't mean you're ever going to climb and any of those mountains right so not knowing just just means you know accepting um that uh becoming aware of the space that's out there not that you're ever actually gonna um know what's truly there right which kind of makes communication important because then you can uh you can uh, crowdsource the work of figuring out what's going on what well, sort of reminds me of zappa zen saying Nothing is what I want. <laughs> like knowing the name of every mountain is what I want. <laughs> now, you brought up a good metaphor because we're going to talk about nature. That's nature, mountains. Computers are new nature, maybe. And usually when I'm talking with you, on your shoulder to one side of you, is a bookshelf and resting on your shoulder is usually Finnegan's Wake. And I've always been amazed at that. Now, I don't see it this time, but it's usually on the other shoulder. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I, uh, I pulled it out. Yeah. Stuck was moving around back there. I'm oh, the, the, right. Well, that's the great. Piece. <laughs> an active bookshelf. So <laughs> I wanted to go over this line that. People often credit to Isaac Newton. 
if I have seen farther than others, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think you really typify this because you stand on the shoulders of so many giants and you're articulate. But I also think, and that's sort of funny because it's almost like a real metaphor or a real object sitting on your shoulder. Finnegan's Wake usually sitting on your shoulder. And now it almost is, you can see it. But usually it's on the other spine, you know, and it's like, hey, he's got Finnegan's Wake on his shoulder. So, you know, Umberto Eco, and, and this is funny because James Joyce said he was applied Aquinas. And Marsha McLuhan said he was applied Joyce. He took that phrase from Joyce and says, well, if Joyce says I'm applied Aquinas, Marshall said, well, I'm applied Joyce. Off the top of your head, who would Clinton be? Applied blank. Siegfried Gideon's approach, um, which McLuhan saw as important, was um, anonymous history. So the documentary I made that sort of star started off my crazy trip of an, of an adventure in trying to explain cyberspace was digging through computer history um, using the approach of Siegfried Gideon. So I tried to apply what he had done. Um, as best I could. I can't claim to be any, you know, expert yeah. in Gideon per se, beyond having read his two major books and tried to think about computers in, in that regard. Yeah, yeah. But you, Glenn, you said, okay, I'm applied Gideon. Explain that in one or two lines, layperson's terms. What does that mean, Gideon? What do you mean by you're applying him? What is, what's the uh, crux of that biscuit? Analyzing... Um, our mechanical devices as though they were art pieces, which, which is to see them as an expression of something human, not just as dead, inert material. Like materialism is where you think of, oh, it's just a, an object, right? Machines don't feel all this stuff. No, no, everything we produce is an expression meant to fulfill a human need. It will, someone had the ambition and the drive to bring it into fruition. Um, everything, the, uh, all the names on all the patents that are buried in the patent office for all the most mundane, stupid stuff, office chairs and, 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 and all the junk and right. The refrigerator was birthed from the mind of someone passionate enough to, you know, do something incredible for our right. So re imbue the material world with the humanity, the story of the many nameless anonymous forgotten and inventors, right? Edison didn't invent everything. He invented the light bulb and six other things, right? We remember e e e e Edison, but we forget the 10,000 other people who, you know, birthed the, the modern technological world, right? That's what Gide Gideon was more about, ex exposing that uh, greater that greater world of anonymous history of artifacts. That was so well done. And, and it reminded me of people like... Mohali Naji, who there's a documentary about him in Salvador Dali, and it's just endless, you know, Henry Darger, outsider artist. So, so staying on this um, <clears throat> shoulders, Umberto Eco, who's sort of a wannabe Joyce McLuhanite and uh, anti-Joyce McLuhanite, <laughs> very interesting Italian thinker, Umberto Eco wrote a book called The Name of the Rose. And in it, he says, we are dwarfs, but dwarfs who stand on the shoulder of those giants and small though we are, <clears throat> we sometimes manage to see farther on the horizon than they. So <clears throat> you're standing on the, you know, Joyce was standing on the shoulders of, of uh, excuse me, of Aquinas, and he may have took it farther. McLuhan was standing on the shoulders of Joyce, and he may take it take it farther. <clears throat> excuse me. What are your aspirations? You're standing on the shoulders of Gideon. What do you aspire to do? How do you aspire to take it further? I think. Really, it's about passing back credit to, well, 
let's continue what we were saying back to the giants on the one hand but also the crowds the forgotten multitudes of of the of the collective you know uh, productive effort of the anonymous those who are anonymous in in history i mean you got to give credit the story the collective story of the world that we're all involved in is mostly untold we tell you know the stories of the few giants in my particular expertise right everything gets gets thrown back to steve jobs and bill gates for instance right as though they had birthed totally formed the computer industry like like jove or right? out, out of their heads or something right um um <laughs> that's just the way it's received popularly right um so all i want to do is just throw light backward look back so that we can see more uh in a more nuanced way how it is we've come to where we are today i mean that's what gideon did it wasn't about him it was about hey look at all these uh, anonymous inventors McLuhan wasn't all about M M McLuhan taking contrast someone like Sig Sigmund Freud Sigmund Freud was full of himself right he he was the father of psychoanalysis he had to be the figurehead right right he had to be the start of it right you like that kind of egotism which is probably a very heavy charge to throw at Sigmund Freud <laughs> I mean, who who am I to say that, right? But but, <laughs> but you know, comparatively, comparatively, you really want to um, pass the credit back, so that uh, yeah, my project would be just more to ex explore the past and to give it continuity to to perceptions of the present. The past isn't the past. The past is alive today, but the recent past is alive today. And the recent past is something that's still so new and fresh, no one can sort through it to see what's important yet. Right? We all know what was going on in the distant past because we've had de decades of historians and researchers arguing about it. But what, what the hell happened 10, 5 years ago to get us into this current state? Um, you know, like the New York Times or whatever had its take, its first draft of history, but it's still, it's still, you know, how we got to the recent past and how from the recent past we got to today is uh, is still up for debate. It's still too fresh, it's still too soon, right? That's the kind of short-term bridges that uh, would make the longer past useful for gaining perception of our present. Really good. Be here now, man. You are so present. I appreciate it. But Clinton, I want you to flip into your opposite now. Take that fourth step of the tetrad and, and if pressed to an extreme, how do you flip it into your opposite? And I will quote Marshall saying, communication of the new is a miracle, but not impossible. And I'll crack a joke that he loved. You know, the priest is crossing the Canadian border, because you're in Canada, I'm in the US, it's crossing the border. And the custom officer says, excuse me, father, what's in that flask? Then he goes, that's water. And the custom officer unscrews it, takes a swig, and he goes, that's whiskey. And the priest goes, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this was a joke I learned from Marshall and communication of the new is a miracle, but not impossible. What you said, your aspiration was deep, but take it one step further with all of that. What would you like to do? Do you want to become the new Zizek? You want to make money with your podcast? I'm telling the Clinton aspiration. The Clinton aspiration was pure what you just said, but I'm saying push it really far. Right now you have a day job and I think working a day job enables you to come home and use your real deep brain cells to do your real work. And then you can not waste them in your day job. What's your aspiration if you could be anything right now doing exactly? You want academia? You want to get tenure? You want to be, you know, a pop psychologist or, you know, you what, what would, if you could ideally do that and flip it, what would you say your aspiration would be there? Oh, geez, Jerry, you know how to get straight to, straight to the tough <laughs> question, which I appreciate very much. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, if I knew what I wanted, that's funny. If I knew what I wanted, I'd be going after it. I mean, honestly, what I, uh, I really, 
Um, yeah, I just want to uh, keep making sense. I mean, there was a period a few years ago when stuff stopped making sense, and I had a little scheme hatched in my in my rational in my rationality, which I was harboring in spite of the perception of chaos. That uh, damn, I just need to swim to the other side of this, uh, you know, of this river and uh, gain my bearings again. And uh, I know I feel pretty pretty good about that. I think uh, I'm walking on. Uh, I'm not, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as, uh, like, beyond that, beyond finding a, a few of my lost marbles, hell, I, I, my aspirations are, uh, are to, um, um, uh, consider my opportunities. Man, I don't know. I'm the vaguest person in the world. I, I'm, uh. No, vagueness I, I is good. Again, I didn't want to get you on the spot. It's beautiful because I would just say if you could get paid a really good salary or better than you get on your day job to advise Elon Musk at, oh, no. at, at on McLuhan or somebody of his ilk that you these, approve of. No, man, I'm just all these ideas you're coming up are just fantastical. I'm uh I'm just the guy with the YouTube series throwing stuff out there, but uh right. Uh, and and I'm just it, it, an absolute dream, of course, of course. Yeah, okay, um, good. I'm uh, yeah, I'm all uh, ears, but geez, this yeah, is all beyond making, my own. <laughs> this is all yeah, beyond making, my own formulations, but uh, yeah. I appreciate your high appraisal of my. And um, and, and here's you're telling me what you think of me, and I'm and I'm humbled. Yeah, well, it's 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 true because <laughs> you, could, you could flick. You could flip that making sense S E N S E to making C E N T S. <laughs> oh damn! But but we're gonna stay on this uh, one quote, um, and I do want you to tell me the name of the video so people know. It's a portrait of a media theorist. How does that video title go? A por Oh, that you is that. Is that a video? It's, it, it's an essay. Oh, but you also made a video that's 15 minutes. It's actually your MEA talk. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My MEA talk from 2019. It's is, called, uh, it's, yeah. I, yeah, it, it might be named It's after my, um, it's probably named after my thing. You're but right. it's called A Portrait of a Media Theorist. And then there's a subtitle. As a young there. man. Okay, so this, so uh, like six months ago, I made a video a portrait of a media theorist as a young man yes uh yeah okay on june 17 2020 now we're going to jump back and you're going to tell me the name of the documentary on computer history is called what silicon and charybdis and that is available on youtube yes it is good okay and what year is that oh heck let's see the um about 27 I think through 2018. Okay, so three that's parts, two three three installments. Yeah. in three installments. Yeah. So the total time is what of the whole video? Oh, if you were to watch them all, it'd be about an hour, I think. Okay, one hour. Good. Okay, so we're going to go back to uh, the portrait video and essay for a second because Wyndham Lewis is discussed. And um, I like that because he said the our artists live in the present and write a detailed history of the future. And I think that's what you're doing. You're writing a detailed history of the future because you know to be in the present, being a, a computer person, mm -hmm. you're a netizen and, and you use some words that we're going to delve deep into, geek and nerd. And I just say you're a, a, a real deep student of computers and the net. And Wyndham said, we live in the present. So you're living in the present. Everybody's subsumed by this. You're writing a detailed history, which is really very detailed. You tell all the players in computer history of the re uh, detailed history of the future so that that enables us to actually have what i call anticipatory mindfulness am you get up early and go to school you get up and you're you're aware you're best you know people are best in the morning so let's let's do what you did with gideon 
in layperson's term on Wyndham Lewis and Voglin. Is that how you pronounce the other guy's name? Voglin, I believe. Voglin. Okay. Now, on Voglin and Wyndham, do what you did for me on Gideon. In, yeah, in a, right. yeah. Go ahead. So, so uh, Wyndham Lewis uh, was a... Well, he was a prolific writer, was paying very close attention to very large scales of politics during the most tumultuous time in history. The world of right, he was in World War One. He was ranting and screaming about the anticipation of World War Two. He was um, um, looking at all the smart people society was holding up and and mercilessly tearing them apart with 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 his own with his own perceptions of them right his his, uh his english i find immaculate most people find it well i i find his 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 written words to be very elegant but all of his sentences are like 40 words long um right it's lots of people find him a horribly clumsy writer right um (laughs) um but uh i think it's great uh he um anyway uh but he definitely was a nasty um uh dude who didn't suffer fools gladly and uh wrote about it and between the lines of that you can see there's lots of really good psychology and analysis of you know all the idiots he was stuck with so so it's kind of interesting um but um, but, uh, clinton what you did with gideon is you told me he analyzed mechanical Mm -hmm. devices as art pieces to experience so we could experience the humanness in both the mechanical device and the art piece. That's what I got in a summary. What did, what did Wyndham do in that, you know, two sentence summary, just one or two sentence summary. You laid out who he was. That was good. Cause he's a, he's a quite a character, but what did Wyndham do like for you to attract you to be studying him in a sentence, you know, he looked at uh, the, let's call it, he saw that everyone was getting ADHD and he explained why it was happening. He was a painter a, who would look at a static scene for hours while he painted it. And he, he knew what stillness and solid objects were. But relativity and... Um, Thinkers like Henry Bergson and Alfred Whitehead and Niels Bohr, all these new 20th century thinkers were um, putting t- time and change to be the real re- reality is always time, reality is always change, reality is always flowing. And Wyndham Lewis was arguing, no, all of our civilization is built on believing in still solid objects. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we need to preserve constancy and solidness for us to walk around and be able to think further ahead than just the next few minutes or else we all get adhd if the world is all flux and time that time. was that was really good so you're saying he was like almost a zen still guy he could yeah. you know there's a great quote that uh pascal says you know all the problems of the world would be solved if you could be able to just sit in a room all by yourself quiet or something like that so that's basically what you're saying. Wyndham was able to appreciate stillness and solitude. Yeah, he pulled all the constants. He saw the dimensions, and you know that should be. Yeah. We, we should perceive as being solid. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now Vogelin, is that how you said? Vogelin. Vogelin. Yeah. In one sentence, uh, you can give a little background who he is in the context. But I mean, the way you summarize Gideon and the way you summarize Wyndham Lewis has helped me immensely. These are like the punchline, the cliff notes, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, Vogelin lived in Germany studying under Heidegger, but then had to escape to America and 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 lived in America for the rest of his career. He uh, he interpreted gnosticism gnosticism 
as um as uh this thing which uh still existed in a secular terms in the pr in his present day as marxism and as phenomenology um which is way too sick. many big words dude way too right, many I big know. words I'm you like know you explain yeah, myself you don't yeah, worry, no, you're know. doing you're doing good, but I'm saying in the long run you want to because Gnosticism, phenomenology, these I can't even say it right. I'm Daffy Duck here. <laughs> you, we want to get these people the way you've done it on these other two guys. You've done, but working your way into it is fine. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so to cut to the chase, Vogelin saw that um, lots of people would try to imagine a better world and then just LARP it into existence. And LARP is a new term, um, live action role play. So, hey, if we all act like this new better world is true, we can make it true because we socially construct a better world by, right, like, uh, be the change you want to see in the world as sort of, a religion that doesn't know it's a religion. So Vogelin is really popular for, um, he was paraphrased um, as having uh, basically said, don't eminentize the Eschaton, which is some popular phrase in um, Republican um, um, Republican talking point in the sixties and seventies, I, I guess. And that means, you know, don't, don't, don't tear down the system and try to build a new world. Don't try to make heaven on earth in a secular form, like in a would you would have in a Marxist revolution. But he was say, saying all this in old religious terms. Was the was the language he was using to sort of analyze modern secular politics? That was Vogelin's take. It's people who are trying to live in their dream world, and they feel like an alien in the real world. And so they're like, I'm alienated from everyone. We, I need to find my home. I need to, you know, create my home here on earth and, and, and you know, like, like save the fallen world and bring it into bed, betterness before they really have a chance to appreciate what reality is in the first place. They're jumping the gun and they're not stu stu studying enough of, of what's real. They're jumping straight to the let's make it better phase of their development, right? Change the world before they even understand themselves properly. That's how Vogelin was looking at um, lots of contemporary political um, beliefs on all sides of the spectrum. Let, let me summarize, if, if this sure. is correct. Vogelin said it's he promoted understanding the situation before you try to make the world better. Get a yeah. bigger picture view before you because you you just see an injustice and say let's change this that's sort of like what i say the difference between rebellion and revolution is rebellion is you sell you see something's wrong and you make a point and revolution is re-evolution you see something wrong and you propose a a solution a proposing a solution is is fantastic because that would necessitate that would involve um dialogue dialectic that would involve yep. understanding right heck um uh yeah yeah it's um it's very subtle um well, you but did. what you don't want to do the the thing Vogelin wanted people to avoid was was to was because people who know what the answer should be and just want to rush to making it happen cut out and ignore all the stuff that doesn't fit and then they demonize the people who are never going to go along with it and they otherize it, right? You can't just cut the parts of reality out of your perception that don't agree with what you already know the answer is, right? You, you have to negotiate with all the levels of reality and all, and all of what's going on. That's good. He said, don't otherize. That's good. In fact, the American Indians say your enemy is your best teacher. Mm -hmm. Pascal says, in order to understand anything, you got to understand this end of the spectrum and that and everything in between. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have this comp, what I think is what's called uh, Marshall is comprehensive awareness. And in the real big flip is in, integral awareness or inclusive awareness, because the big flip there is if you flip those, that 
I A, you flip them into A I. <laughs> so you you know before we have A I, you better have I A, which is integral awareness, the big picture. Okay, Clint, you did really good on that because when I uh, co-produced Bob Dobbs on KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles here, David Porter's show, we would take phone calls to my house after the show and people would respond to the to the Bob's talking. And a lot of times I'd get this call. I don't know what that guy's talking about, but I know he's talking about something. <laughs> <laughs> I think what your essay and, and I'm assigning my Zoom participants to study your stuff is, I know he's talking about something, but you know, I don't get it because you know, you talk in terms that are really good, but they're a little more in that media ecology la la ling lexicon lingo. And you, you lose some people because it's not really just plain English bottom line layperson. So mm -hmm. I like this thing that um, the fact that. Um, Marshall, one of his favorite books was called The Code Breakers. And so that's sort of what these mashups are, is our effort to break the code. And, you know, you just say back to the wake, um, just to dab, dabble in Finnegan's Wake for a second too, James Joyce, 1939, inventing uh, whatever we're doing right now, TV show, Zoom Internet, in disguised as a book, and uh, and he said, "Where the hand of man never set foot," and so we we're breaking it down so that people can walk amongst us. I wanted to return to the shoulders, standing on the shoulders for one second before we leave that. In Brian K. Reed, you may know him in computer science, R E I D. He said, we stand uh, in computer science, we stand on each other's foot or excuse me, feet. So he, he took, you know, the Newton. If I have seen farther than others, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And then Echo saying, you know, yeah, I've stand on the shoulders of giants, but somehow I'm managing to look farther than they do. What do you think Reed is meaning in computer science, we stand on each other's feet? Yeah, I know there's, um, with a computer, once you got one, you can do anything with it straight away. The computer is the perfect instant gratification machine. So no one really has to collaborate with everyone else once you've got one. Instead, it becomes a race where everyone tries to write. That's what it, it has been the past couple of decades, right? Um, I'm sure lots of aspects of building computers, which have had, you know, staying power, the important things have been large collective group efforts and lots of cooperation. But for the most part, it's everyone's trying to r compete um, to get out there first and sell their product first in the contemporary landscape. And uh, there's a real egoism ar ar around um it's called not invented here syndrome, NIH syndrome, where people are constantly reinventing the wheel over and over and over again because because uh, they don't want to go use something else. So, you know, um, they have to make everything from scratch and, and uh, everyone's trying to um, to uh, if there's six different competing standards, there's a, these are all just old jokes that I'm that I'm rehashing. But if there's six different ways to achieve a task, then the seventh type person's going to come along and say look i've made one thing that combines all these six into the best but now there's just seven competing ways to do the thing right, right. it's very hard for the new to actually consume and replace the old it just adds to the giant pile of mess and no one gets ahead because things are blowing up horizontally with there's a million different competing linux distributions they're not competing but neither one of them is going to get ahead because they're all squeezing through the scar the starting gate at the same time in 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 parallel right that's uh that's my my reading of uh of Reed's quote. I, I, Great, anyway. it was good. And Clinton, tell me one or two people who have avoided the race and 
did collaborate? Is 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 Jaron Lanier one? Is Sherry, Sherry Turkle one? I mean, who are these people? Who are one or two that you've looked up to that haven't just signed into the race and are willing to collaborate? Well, I have to look at Richard Stallman. Um, he did all the, the work of establishing a legal means for everyone to collaborate on, oh, on free software. Um, where everyone can work from the same source code and improve the one project um, instead of reinventing it for themselves. Uh, yeah, Richard Stallman, um, very, very interesting dude. Definitely changed the world in ways that is still underappreciated. And um, uh, because um, he knew not, he knew how to how how to. Um, transfer the whole hacker ethos of the early days and popularize it at large by by working computers into the legal system so he he was aware of the total social landscape that would entail user freedom and entail cooperation and this sort of hippie-esque like sharing philosophy of everyone coming together he knew how to uh create software licenses enforceable by law that would um, everyone who uses the soft the, so, the software's code had to share it their changes with one another so that everyone worked out in the open and everyone freed up what they were doing for others to collaborate on. Um, that was uh, came, that's the Free Software Foundation came out of that and his GNU project. So yeah, yeah. No, that was a good one. But would you say uh, Jaron Lanier? Do you tip your hat to him or not so much? He seems like a, yeah, he seems like a really insightful dude. I, I've yeah. read a lot of his. Um, I didn't finish it. I ought to. Um, I've read his um, manifesto. How it's called? Um, yeah, that's good. Anyways, yeah, there's probably really many like more that. you could. I've had talks with him about McLuhan and James Joyce, so that's good. But I did want to say that what you're doing with me and I'm so grateful is when I say, let's talk on layperson's terms. And it's funny because I did the etymology on the word and layman comes from 15th century, meaning non-cleric, outsider, unprofessional, non-expert. So this is funny because outsider implies not necessarily a bad thing, but unprofessional, well, there's the innocence, like an outsider artist can create great art just because they didn't go to uh, art school and they might be deemed mentally deficient or mentally, you know, disabled. It doesn't mean they can't create art. So here's the two words I often hear you calling yourself. And I wanted you to understand the etymology behind them. When you say geek, do you know geek came from Sideshow Freak 1916s? It's a U.S. Carney slang. It means fool, dupe, or simpleton. But then in 83, it became a teenage slang for lack of social grace, but obsessed with technical computer skills. Now that's from Anthony Michael Hall in oh. 1984's 16 Candles film. That's where that, and so the, you know, I see that you're obsessed with technical computer, but I don't see you lacking social grace. I find you to have a lot of social grace. So geek doesn't quite apply for me understanding Clinton. Then in 1996, geek out means a techno nerd. So in what year were you born again? 88. 88. So that's four years after uh, the movie. But now here's the other, because words evoke more than their meaning. Nerd is 1951 U.S. student slang. Although it might come from the 40s, N-E-R-T, meaning stupid or crazy person, which could be an alternative of the word nut. You know, and we know what a nut is. But now in 1950, Dr. Seuss wrote a book, uh, If I Ran the Zoo. And, um, you know, this is funny because nerd and geek don't work for me in explaining people to you 
of, about Clinton. What is another word you would feel proud of being said? Clinton, I am a, you know, you usually say netizen is good, but something in, in social terms that everybody knows. Like netizen is a made up word, but a word that people are aware of and know. What would you call yourself? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, 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 I don't, communicator, why not? You sort of bring oh, it out. Good. A communicator, I, I was going to say. Pick, lots of words are pretentious. I, I, no. I, I hate labeling no, myself. <laughs> I know, it, it's a horrible thing. We're, we're not of that type, but it's fun <laughs> that you, you pick that because I would say you're, would you be happy with a computer historian or a computer scholar? Great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Compu a, a human, well, a humanizer, uh, maybe. I uh, don't know. That's quite, that's what oh, I like to get to. A well, humanizer. Someone... Yeah. 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 No, I like those too. It, it's not too, but I like this question taking the etymology of the word nerd farther. Might have been rooted in Dr. Seuss if I ran the zoo. If you were the president starting in January 2021 of the U.S., what would be first on your agenda? What would you do, Clinton? Oh, heck. Oh, heck. Without knowing the course of action I would take, I, I, I haven't considered it with the responsibility that would be due but uh, i would look at um consider section 230 reform okay um, section 230 is means what in layperson's tune section 230 reform what does that mean so in the 90s in the 90s um the communications decency act in the states um uh, had uh, it finally got passed with this um, with this section, which uh, said that um, that um, if you're a neutral, if you're just a neutral website platform that other people can post to, you're not le legally liable for what other people post to it. So, so, uh, so back then it would be something like CompuServe or AOL. Today it'd be something like Facebook or Twitter not legally liable for what users do on their platform if they are a neutral sort of conduit like a telephone company if i'm a mob boss and i call you up on the telephone and and we plan something illegal and uh, you you can't go sue at&t for giving me a telephone right the telephone is just a neutral carrier right so then there's got to be some something more nuanced in there. I'm not sure. Again, I'm not prescribing anything that I would know what I would do, but I think, I think, uh, I think it's due to be looked at and considered heavily. Um, Re-examining the role of social media platforms in society, I suppose. Yeah, and that's very well put. You did it explicitly, and you t you told me you isolated like. I like the Marcel Duchamp quote, there's no solution because there's no problem. Well, that sounds sort of mamby-pamby, like, hey, <laughs> you know, but again, we, it's, you know, it gets Zen again, where Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. So I, I used to pose to all my McLuhan people 25 years ago, well, if we acknowledge the disservices, aren't we just empowering them? You know, if we go, well, this is a disservice of this human invention, then what we're just empowering it. Well, no, if you study the disservices, you could flip them into your breakdowns into breakthroughs, you know. So I wanted to study this word flip with you. And, and you know, you've studied the tetrad, and I thought it was very interesting. I do not know the roots of every of, of the four questions as much as I should, but I think the fourth step of the tetrad is amazing because if you take some object, some human invention, some 
non-tangible human invention even, philosophy, bulldozer, cell phone. You take it and you push it to an extreme, what might it flip into? And we know we're not doing it on the object, the cell phone. We're doing it on the environment that the cell phone created. And we're doing it not on the intention of the cell phone. Oh my God, a cell phone can have saved my parents' life. They could fall down and call someone immediately and that could save their life. So we know the intention. I always say the, the great one is <clears throat> if, if Henry Ford helped invent the car, did he go, you know, and if he did tetrad analysis on it, is him and his people could have gone, well, you know, Henry, someday people will use these as, as machines to kill other people. Like they'll be called car bombs. And so would he have gone, well, we better not put this out into the world, you know? And so someone said he might have had that in his mind. Who knows? <laughs> but this is what, you know, we're trying to do with, uh, we did a, a tetrad on, on a digital vaccine the other day. And people were like, well, that sounds sort of kooky, but you know, how are they going to test if everybody's been vaccinated? Well, you put a shoot a chip in them with the vaccine. And so blah, 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 you know, and it sounds like sci-fi. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the, um, the etymology of the word flip. And then you can discuss as you're hearing these, how this word evolved, what, you really think Marshall was saying in flipping, you know, flip this invention to an extreme. What will it flip into? What could it flip into? So it was in 1590s, the word flip came about to toss with the thumb, which is funny because Marshall's obsessed with TV as tactility. So oh. it's amazing. Now, in 1911, D.H. Lawrence used flip as a euphemism for fucking. <laughs> but we can even go back to 16. So this is funny. 1690s, sailors had a hot drink, beer, brandy, and sugar, and they'd whip it up, and it was called a flip. And then you go to 1949 to flip out, flip one's lid, to go wild. And then 1949, same year, 10 years after the wake, flip side of a gramophone record. You'd like, hey, what's on the other side of this record? And then 1952, flip one's wig, which is, you know, this is this is immense where this, oh, then actually it, it, it goes one more step, flip flop, is 1970s for a beach sandal. And then 1900 flip-flop was a complete re reversal of direction, which is, I always think that <clears throat> what I learned about Mar studying Marshall was he was a guy who would flip-flop. He'd be arguing with you. And then all of a sudden he goes, oh, I agree with you. And they go, hey, you got to stand your ground. Don't be, you don't have no integrity. <laughs> he was a flip-flop agent. So it's a pretty simple question, but in general, what do you think of this word flip in the fourth step of a fourth uh, question of the tetrad? If you take it to an extreme, what could it flip into? Tell all me these, about that. Yeah, all these physical objects like flipping a coin or flipping over your your album. Um the tetradic flip is analogous to that, but it sort of occurs in this subjective headspace it it takes place in our collective socially shared socially constructed space that we inhabit which includes abstract thoughts um you know is it includes you know the intentions all, all the parts of the human factor uh and psychology is part of sort of this like super physical social space where all, all these tetrad actions take place so uh for instance um if the car retrieves the knight in shining armor right it's 
it's not taking that's taking place in our imaginary evocation of what it is a suit of armor does it's steel it's heavy it moves fast on a horse it protects you right right it uh so the um the flip the flipping takes place in like you said um how does the phone change the human environment of of now people who are in danger can call someone straight away right so you got the phone as a mean of a means of communication but you could see how um how that could flip with too much communication you can get uh noise or signals or active um disinformation and you could um turn the the entire electric global network into a into um an impenetrable fog of of contradictions that keeps you isolated where you're at and you don't know what's going on outside of your own immediate embodied surround because it's all it's all noise too much communication can if 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 uh it exceeds our human subjective ability to make sense of it um instantly cuts everyone off right when it gets out of control um uh right so that would be a flip um uh both in the you know we've all flipped our lid since uh <laughs> hell even in the i'm drunk on hot beer and and brandy was what was it you said sort of sense if you wanted hot, to <laughs> hot brandy beer and sugar whipped up to a foaming delight <laughs> Oof. yeah i could see some of that yeah uh yeah so so the flip takes place in in the in the um reaction of the constants of human nature the unchanging parts about human in relation to their ever-changing env in environment within the changing in in environment the the human who's always trying to adapt as best they can to the changes um um the, the terms that they get comfortable to suddenly flip their meaning or the objects that they were using for something suddenly turn around and and start uh you start employing them for something completely different um, when some threshold gets crossed of magnitude or quantity. That was good, Clinton, because uh, there's uh, some I read, I think, in Cameron's New Sciences that said, Marshall said, art is to show what our world is made of. How simple is that to show what our world is made of? And um, that was interesting how you took the word flip and you must have ESP. You think you have ESP? Uh, I think I'm a sensible guy. <laughs> I think you have cloned ESP at least because you touched on the next thing I want to talk about in, in The Mechanical Bride, Marshall's first book in 51. He said, a citadel of inclusive awareness and the dim dream of collective consciousness. Now, before you go into what you think that's about, it's funny because I I did I always said integral awareness. That's where I got the IA from. For Marshall says somewhere integral awareness. And here he was saying inclusive awareness, and I think they're interestingly connected but maybe different. And then flip that into AI. I think I made that up, which is how do you flip integral awareness into AI, artificial intelligence, which is something we're all dominated by now. Oh my God, we're going to have robots doing this for this and that for that. Oh, well, you know, we've had words doing this and that for us from the beginning of time. So don't freak out. So the first thing, what do you think Marshall was talking about? A citadel, which is something you talked about, it seems, like this private castle you have in your in your Facebook cell phone world. You're you're in your little Zoom box, and in but in fact, in fact, Zoom boxes reach out to other people. I haven't heard of so too many people doing Zooms with themselves, <laughs> all by themselves. But oh, tell me what you think about. Oh, go ahead. Just it's called owning a mirror. <laughs> in <your> bedroom. <laughs> That's called narcissism, narcissism as narcosis. Okay, so 
a citadel of inclusive awareness and the dim dim dream of collective consciousness what the heck was marshall talking about in those that two phrases in layperson's term so when we want to talk about social changes often people will try to create a model of what's going on they, they want to turn the scene into this machine and they usually they'll say like here's the paradigm or here's the model or right uh, the brain is an information processing machine and uh we've moved from uh, this superstitious old paradigm into this new scientific paradigm and it's, it's this abstract book like model um McLuhan would say you know it's a typographical mind trying to turn everything into a whole bunch of concepts uh, I just want to visualize the model of what's going on and then I can put all the people and put everything I see into this model and then something's going to change and that model is going to break down and then we're going to have to maybe break through to some new model right um, the citadel of consciousness transcends that it's uh it's um, using your subconscious, let's let's put it this way at first, it's uh, using your subconscious to think with and then, and then um, finding out what you mean later because you're just feeling out what's going on. Proportionately, you've got poise. It's like, I don't have to think about walking anymore. I learned how to walk. When I was a kid, it was like left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. I'd fall over, right? Got to learn how to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Um, when you have a whole bunch of concepts, you got to switch from one to the other and you got to switch from one to the other. And maybe you're not sure where they line up to form a bigger whole. So if, if you learned how to drive in an automatic car and then suddenly someone lent you their uh, stick shift manual transmission and now you got to start thinking about shifting gears and it's all new new to you and you're trying to focus okay i'm trying to drive but oh my god i got a stick shift and you're trying to line it all up and it's, it's two different paradigms that don't fit together as a natural you, you don't have a feel for driving a manual yet right so so the citadel of inclusive awareness is when everything you've got to do all of your habits and the world that you're inhabiting are one in the same in the sort of inclusive conscious awareness and it, it takes a balance of all of your senses right you see what's going on and you hear what's going on and you feel what's going on and i don't know if you i'm sure if you smell something funny you know what's up <laughs> sorry but it's all coming to, it's all coming together right um uh yeah yeah it's uh it's transcending that whole visual space um that here's a model here's a model here's a model go learn and teach the model and live in the model sort of typographical headspace um i think there's two citadels of conscious awareness forming um one of which lives in the physical reality of still static newtonian space like we were talking about wyndham lewis where computer is just hardware boxes that you can program and then the other one much much larger is takes if it takes for granted or it looks only at the content of computers as a new application and every new application is a new medium and it's a new medium all the time. And so computers are always changing. And I, I knew how to work this last week and then they changed everything on me. What the hell's going on? Right. And so the world is constantly changing. And so this second more popular, um, um, uh, um, for m m mode of being where, where people are trying to get comfortable in working with their media and attain this, this, uh, inclusive consciousness is in a world which isn't computer literate the way that I'm trying to demonstrate computer literacy could be, I suppose. Um, it's that sort was, of the... No, that was really good because I would just want to inject um, Lillian Hellman said it so well. She said, people change and forget to tell you they change. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, hey, we're changing how you lay out on your email, but we're we didn't forget to change. We're telling you right now, oh, you can't change where I'm so sad. But that was really well put mm -hmm. what you did because you you returned, you said citadel of co private consciousness, and then you said citadel of in inclusive awareness. And before we go into the dim dream of collective consciousness, which I think is pretty heavy in, in saying these two different things, go back 
to this acidital of inclusive awareness? And how is that different from integral awareness? Are they one and the same or is there some diff subtle difference or blatant difference? I think those two, I think they're complementary. Like they're at a, a right angle to 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 one another. Remember when I was talking about Vogelin, I was saying he was worried that Gnostics wanted to create their perfect dr dream world and would just cut out everything that didn't fit. It wasn't inclusive, right? Everyone who doesn't agree with me just hasn't bothered doing their homework or understanding why I'm right yet. They'll come along or they're wrong or, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get rid of them so, somehow because we got the perfect system. I know my system's inclusive of everyone. They sell themselves. They think they got the best model, right? They're so sure of themselves. And so everything that doesn't fit must just be wrong and bad, right? So that's not a very inclusive awareness. Um, now the integrality, um, integral awareness is an ideal. You're never going to really integrate everything you see in your senses all the time. Um, I was reading, I was reading someone writing about how, uh, how that's like trying to build a roof over your house that includes the stars in the sky within its vaults. <laughs> right. You can't. Oh, nice. Right. Right. But um, but to the means, like I said, where your models can, you can feel where where what other people model actually fits together in your habit forming, which inhabits the habitat in which everything happens. That's the, in, the, the integrality, the ability to feel the seams of where things come together across their different domains as a, as the whole through just your 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 mode of being to which your own conscious awareness is latent to like you're behind your own habits. We don't really know who we are. We always try to know who we are. And then, I mean, I'm sure even today, um, lots of people will, will, will realize something new about themselves they've been doing all along, right? You, if we, we don't have a full account of our own habits, um, <laughs> right? But there's things that are integrated in, inside of us, um, you know, across, across models, right? Yeah. Well yeah. put, Clint, really well put, because it brought up... Um... Building a roof that includes the stars in the sky was done by humans. It's called a planetarium. <laughs> true, yeah, true. But, but it's not it's not real stars unless they open up a glass thing and show you real stars. But in general, we try to fake nature and go, look at here's the sky, here's the stars. So really good comment because now it's a great topic to do for Tetrad as planetarium. But what you you brought up a little earlier was the word subconscious and operating on our subconscious level. And George Lakoff says something like being a neuroscientist. He says, you know, we we really operate 80 percent subconsciously or unconsciously. And we think we're, you know, 100 percent conscious. And in you bringing up this habitual activity, we breathe automatically. And, you know, we often in our Zooms, we take a deep breath in together. So we consciously do something that you normally do on autopilot. And that's what I say is a perfect metaphor for Tetrad analysis is we're going to consciously figure out what planetariums have done to us, how they've shaped our behavior and not just go, oh, let's go to the planetarium, you know, in, in, so what what is the difference between subconscious and intuition? So I I usually ask people, let's do these tetrads, intuitive, impulsive feeling. And so they'll go, what's what does this flip into? And they'll go, oh dear. And I go, that's a good answer because it's the first thing that came out of their mouth. Or um, uh, I I want to encourage you to come to any of our Finnegan's Wake. Uh, reading clubs online now. They're amazing. And you really experience reading the wake out loud with a group of people, really deep. And um, one of our members goes, I asked him a question, what does a book flip into when pressed to an extreme? He goes, well, I'm going to say, and that is, I say, that is an amazing answer. He couches every answer with, I am going to say. So he's using, you know, verbal language. So 
basically, what's the difference between subconscious, unconscious, intuition, impulse? How do you uh, how do you suss those out? Okay. I'm going to say that uh, intuition um, can be repressed. People can be totally out of touch with their intuition. They they might have none. Maybe they just stand there like a dummy whenever something happens, and and you know, just do what you feel is right is terrible advice for them because you know it's completely useless right they're completely out of touch with themselves so some lots of people you can have a variable relation to your intuition but everyone's got a subconscious i see everybody's is somehow being affected by their subconscious yeah oh yeah yeah so it's uh, sort of the difference between making a change or being uh, voluntary change or forced change. Yeah. I've, uh, I've said the amazing thing about COVID is that it forced change and voluntary change is usually better than forced change. I make a value judgment. So it's interesting. Like if you're in a job and you don't like it, and you go, well, I make enough money and, you know, I'll suffer through it because I need the money. Or you go, nope, I'm going to go to the boss and say I'm leaving because I want to move on in my life. You know, that how you operate, how humans operate on forced and voluntary change. Any comment on that so sort of idea? Yeah, Um just because of what I've been reading recently, it might be easy to put these in um, in Freudian terms. Let's go talk in Freudian terms because no one does it anymore. It's, uh, you know, like basically um, the 20th century was born out of everyone talking about and understanding Sigmund Freud. And now absolutely no one refers to his language whatsoever. And so nowadays, conversation nowadays is completely lost trying to explain like postmodernism or, or you know, all these fights over, you know, the postmodernists and, oh, Derrida is good, Jacques Lacan is bad, whatever, what, what, whatever. These fights are being had right now by people who have never talked about Sigmund Freud in their entire life. Right. And so, of course, they, they can't get anywhere because they don't understand what the hell they're talking about, right? Um, so, so that's why I'm choosing to say, um, there's the death drive and then there's the libido, right? So we, we have the death drive, which, which is, you know, I just want to go back to the womb and be comfortable and have nothing change. Please just get me in a cycle and you know, the sun goes up, I eat, the sun goes down, I sleep, the sun comes up. I just want, you know, I just want to like be as close to being already dead already and passive as I can be. That, that would just be comfortable, please. Right. And then, and then in this weird paradoxical way in our ever-changing complicated landscape where we have to grow up and take responsibilities, that drive for comfort becomes this libidinal force to constantly change and reevaluate ourselves, right? In our chase for comfort, we end up pushing ourselves into new scary situations and, and, and enact our will and start doing new things and threatening our safety and comfort for, and taking risks, right? That, uh, towards the pleasure principle and enjoyment, right? And so that uh, will to live, um, libidinal energy <laughs> is, uh, is, you know, empowering and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, penetrating and, and risk-taking, right? So it's, it's like trying to find the, the constant balance between these forces of, uh, as, as you were saying, what were, were, were well, my your great um you know like we're, we're being forced to change gets us all uncomfortable and now and when we accept the will and take on responsibility to change and then you know invest our our energies in in proactively changing instead of getting run over right yeah yeah so you're you're like force change is more like death drive voluntary change is more libido yeah Yes. Yeah, that was good. You really taught me a lot about Freud. That was super well put. And Clint, you did it on layperson's terms. So it reminded me of this whole thing of Marshall avoiding moral or value judgments. I love that. And you've talked about that so well in your videos and essays. And, you know, literally, 
I, I think it's great to think we can separate the head from the heart, you know, and we can separate, you know, feelings from thinking. But I think they're so closely connected that you can't. But since we invented the words, we can. <laughs> we can say, oh, that's more feeling or that's more thinking. That's Science. more head. Yeah, that's more heart. So Marshall said the work of the artist is to make humanity by creating the perception of the environments, not mm -hmm. to remake humanity into something else. So I made a value judgment. I'm saying, well, force change is, uh, is not as good. Voluntary change is better. But indeed, they're both something humans should and can deal with. It's how you cope with it. How do you talk about this Marshall's work of the artist to make humanity by creating the perception of environment and not to remake humanity into something else and that idea of value judgments? Well, no one was listening to McLuhan when he was a judgmental sort of finicky guy um, in the 40s. No, no one would publish his books uh, he couldn't get Typhon in America pu pu published. He had to tone, tone it down. And a couple of years later, finally Mechanical Bride came out. And by the time that came out, he's like, this is all old and useless now because television is going to change the mechanical world. And anyways, my book is like a thousand years out of date anyway, by now, right? Um, so I, the moral work was actually communicating, getting through to other people, getting people to see what was real right their perception of reality the perception of their en environment was so far gone and all the artists were such sellouts that you didn't need to make art that judged anybody you just had to get people to see what the hell was going on at all um and you you get more flies with honey than vinegar even though we all know that's not true if you own a vinegar bottle and you wake up and it's full of fruit flies right but, um, but, <laughs> but, um, right. Um, however, um, not making moral judgments in his public amplified public persona, who he's going to be in front of the camera, who he's going to be as an author, who he's going to be as a public name, having this very tight separation between Marshall McLuhan, the sensation, the phenomenon, the image, right. And, and McLuhan, you know, the private dude who like, went to church every day and hated technology and, 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 you know, was disappointed all his kids didn't, you know, stay Catholic and all, and all this stuff, right. Two completely separate, separate um, conceptions of his oneself. And, and he, he was integral in his being because he understood how his environment would allow him to be himself in the flesh with his relations at some times and how his environment, when you stick a, a camera or a, or a, you know, a um, typist, um, uh, someone to transcribe his every thought in front of his face now he's in an environment where he's speaking to masses of people or he's pu publics of book readers or right he's still himself but he's got to emphasize to the people he's now communicating with through through media stuff that will just get them to listen to him and to see their world new and understand that they can make sense of the reality in front in front of their face and get more in touch with their own subconscious by getting more in touch with the world that's making and remaking them every day as they interface with it well done and so we we got to flip back in time mechanical bride you brought it up in the second part of the comment we were talking about a citadel of inclusive awareness and the dim dream of collective consciousness what does this mean dim d-i-m dim dream of collective consciousness suss that out what do you think he was saying there as individual frail humans and i relate very heavily to this maybe like i don't even know the names of most of the mountains in the world to read to bring back that metaphor from 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 earlier the world is opaque and dark to me it's abysmal i i got a light on in my bedroom i'm looking at you and who knows what the hell else is going on on this planet i'm supposedly connected to right now 
right? People say, I have all the information in the world in my fingertips nowadays, and here I am wasting my time staring at stupid cat videos or whatever, right? <laughs> they got this dim awareness that they could, if they knew what they... If they knew what, if they had a lead, if they had something that they knew they could chase down, they could, you know, throw a flare out there and see somewhat deeper into the abyss, see so much, somewhat further down the horizon. If they knew what giants whose shoulders they could work to climb onto, <laughs> right, right. But uh, reality is mostly dim to everyone, hence the need for collective, for collective consciousness. Which again, we have a we have a hard time as individuals, which is a. McLuhan says owing as Gutenberg. Lots of people say Descartes when he said cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. And so he, he made the individual the center of their reality, sort of built a wall between communication, which is why McLuhan was all about, she tried to be a communications theorist. Um, I was sitting in front of the CBC building here in Ottawa. We've got the CBC radio headquarters down on Queen Street. And there's a little bench next to a bus stop. And I had some time to kill, so I was like, I'm just going to see what happened. I pulled out my copy of McLuhan's Gutenberg Galaxy, and I sat on a bench in front of the front doors of the CBC building. I was going to see if anyone would, would comment. I was actually reading, but I was also kind of show, showboating. And this dude walks out in a suit, and he's waiting for a bus, and he walks back and forth in front of me a few times. And, and then his bus pulls up, and as he's getting on the bus, he turns to me and goes, Hey, you know, for a guy who was supposed to be a communications expert, that guy really couldn't communicate anything, could he? <laughs> <laughs> so we laughed and i laughed back and you know <laughs> have a good day man he got on the bus and left right that's the opinion of marshall McLuhan from people who work at the cbc right the canadian broadcasting company <laughs> so <laughs> well, wait, right. your, your comment really um hoiked up this uh, line needle the subnabulism that these inventions of ours put us in this in the dim dream of collective consciousness and that we can actually needle people out of that dream. And uh, the other thing that I really wanted to uh, um, tell you, um, your, your comment about knowing the names of mountains, you know, that James Joyce put like 1,500 names of rivers in Finnegan's Wake supposedly just to teach people the names of rivers <laughs> it's like you didn't even know that but you were actually you know somehow cloned esp getting through the wake sitting on your shoulder you know the, the shoulder thing and so we're coming to a close here uh um and in the, the the end is never near but um you know, the time-space uh, continuum, this whole thing of, you know, we could do a whole, we'll do one on time and space. You know, Sun Ra says space is the place and um, time is money. And there's all these cliches about time and space. And Marshall said time is the very hesitant hesitation between a multiplicity of possibilities which sounds like a lot of big words that, you know, the lay person would have trouble with. But in a letter that Marshall wrote to Harold Hill 60 years ago, um, uh, he says that Harry Sc Scornia, is that how you pronounce his name, deserves to have a TV circuit which would enable him to do his interviewing from an easy chair. <laughs> so this is like, yeah, how about the time space continuum there? It's like Marshall saying, uh, dude, uh, in 60 years, Clinton and Jerry will be sitting there, you know, doing a TV show from Ottawa and Venice, California. And so he sort of, you know, Marshall has ESP or as, um, Martha Graham, I thought, put it well, the dancer. She says, artists aren't ahead of their times. They are their times. Because if you push it to an extreme, both Joyce and Frank Zappa said, all times are happening now. So, you know, in, in layperson's term, how did Marshall differentiate between time and space? Just in a few, you know, uh, you know uh, thoughts, Clinton, I'd appreciate it. Right. Um, 
space ends up being uh, space is uh let's start with time hmm it's funny because uh you know you got Wyndham Lewis has time and space and McLuhan has time and space and and McLuhan was looking at Gnosticism as um as being either people who are groping their way through time or groping their way through space. And so people who are groping their way through time are, uh, they're not in their own time. They're groping around through time. So let's say they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're looking for ancient wisdom from the past and they're reading old books and they're trying to build within themselves this, this, uh, this private well they're trying to build let's say their private citadel out of out of all these parts they can find and this wisdom they can find and, and they're building models of of the world which 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 uh, you know um they can they can sort of build up as a separate individual you know fortress to to hide in from from the space that they don't understand whereas space is something that you're totally involved in and um and you're feeling about and uh and you're uh, passionately you know throwing yourself into different situations and 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 you're 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 obliterating the order until you you reach the sort of eastern zen state um leaf in the wind sort of um sort of acceptance of uh right you're not man man i'm not sure if that specifically that specifically is a very good answer, but that's uh, it's something that this is a question that's very, very hard to just wing into layman's terms. It's a yeah, well, that's you, you did good, Clint. You did good because this is it. Um, they asked John Cage, Could you tell us the difference between time and space or some you know complicated question? He goes, That's a very good question. I wouldn't want to ruin it with an answer. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, hell. <laughs> This is grounds for f further research because the other one I really want, you know, and this is something you could think about it for our future meetings is um, the difference between art and science and how Marshall said something in what in culture is our business that art is science and science is art or what did he say? I don't know, but you would tell me some other time because do you know the word judo came about in about 1889, it means gentle way, Jew, uh, soft, soft gentleness, and do means a way or an art. So it's it's an amazing word. But refined judo is jujitsu. And that was like 1882. And actually, uh, they say 1875. Jew again means way you mean soft gentleness and jitsu means art comma science so it's amazing that jujitsu really summarized marshall saying this this combo burrito of art and science and you know it's something i want to pursue in the future is judo is the direction how like alan watts was saying this morning Judo is how to cooperate with direction. So, you know, judo and jujitsu is give and take. It's something I think Marshall was well a master of jujitsu and judo. You know, soft and gentle. Just watch him with Norman Mailer on YouTube. And merging art and science, yet being able to differentiate between art and science. And if we follow the way of nature, you know, will the right, you know, what, what do we prefer, the right people or the right means? I mean, these are all questions I want to ask in the future. But um, in, in closing, um, I want to encourage us to, to study these topics in the future, Clinton. Interfaith autonomy. You know, what is interface and what is autonomy? And mm -hmm. body syntonic programming. Boy, am I, I want to know more about that. And 
<clears throat> especially simulation theory, because my friend Rodney Asher's new film is going to premiere in Sundance in two months. It's called A Glitch in the Matrix, and it's based on a Philip K. Dick lecture. So definitely check out the, the um, one minute preview on YouTube. But sure. it, it reminded me of a T-shirt I saw once that said, the Matrix was a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if, if I have one final question, I want to thank you. If you have any comments to, to um, summarize, you've done amazing in teaching me. I'm a student. I know you're a student. Andrew, Andrew McLuhan says he's a student of a student. <laughs> that, that was a great comment. And you're helping us all so much. Any closing comments before I ask you the last question, Clinton? He's come up a few times. Um, Cameron McEwen runs uh, the McLuhan's New Sciences blog. It's McLuhan'sNewSciences.com. And he's got an article that I really like called Perpetuity of Collective Harmony as Judo. And so he uses Judo as a metaphor to describe McLuhan's um, wordplay in that really famous quote uh, from Understanding Media, where he talks about uh, about um, uh, how electricity m may usher in, you know, a new age of harmonious, you know, oneness and all this stuff, right? So, so I suggest you you, you check out the per perpetuity of collective harmony as judo on uh on that blog i'll actually link it to this youtube video I'll, I'll try to make a link to everything that we've been talking about so oh, the link link would be great because i love to spread the word on camera and he is just one of those amazing sources mm -hmm. and we can't he i supposedly won't do zoom but could we have him on one of these and he calls up sure. and it's just his voice Oh sure, I think if he's down for that, I'd love to arrange it. Absolutely. Okay, let's let's plan for camera, and I'll try I'll try my darndest because I've I've done a a couple sessions with them and taped them. Have you done any tape sessions with camera? No, no, I haven't. Oh great, that's that's on on the card for the upcoming. So Clinton, thanks again. This has really been fun and made my Sunday made for a good. Uh, um, way to welcome in the new year from 2020 vision to 2021. And here's the last question. If, um, if rock you've said in a video in the past and, a, uh, an enlightening, uh, dialogue I've listened to online with you and Bob Dobbs, you said that rock is hardware and water is software. You know, this is, um, the, the, uh, Ulysses themes coming through McLuhan and, and somehow you said, well, I think Bob asked you, well, what is rock? And you said hardware. Well, what is water? You said software. My question is, what is the sky or air? In Ah, cool. Um, that's excellent. I was talking about the title of my computer documentary silicon and charybdis silicon and charybdis um uh which is the i think it's yeah it's it's homer's odyssey so they have to bring the ship between the rocks and the whirlpool and so the scylla the rock um the silicon is rock and charybdis is the, the chaos of the whirlpool was water so since it's a nautical theme, clearly the sky must be, you know, the the constellations against which you are um, uh, uh, steering and navigating your ship. Right, but in, in computer terms... Sorry, I, I interrupted. Please continue. But in computer terms, if you say rock is hardware, water is software, sky is constellations, what would it relate to in computer world? Um, all right. Staring uh, through the stack or the levels 
of complexity of the interface where if you were to see what's what is it that's making this stuff on my screen oh it's this oh what code is making that oh it's that code how's this code being run oh here's it's running on the cpu how's the cpu work oh it's got these little switches and, and this clock this clock speed oh and, that, and now you've broken out into re reality because you've, you've looked you've penetrated all the way through the whole stack out to the, the stillness and the staticness of the real world which we'll call the sky looking through the air if um that's how you know that you're in you're looking at the sky and you're not just swimming around in a simulated planetarium in a big swimming pool what so you would say the sky is the interface the sky is the stack with which you can interface all the way through yeah yeah but what is the stack in 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 relation to hardware software what is the stack computers are very very complex so you got to break them down into levels and from this level someone made a more complex level and someone made a more complex level and someone made a more complex level and as, and at the high level you've got your cyberspace with your windows and your files and here's my resume and here's my digital photos of my kid and here's my email attachment and here's my website these are all fake objects these aren't real objects the only real object is the computer but what's the connection how do you feel your way from the fake objects down to their genesis down through their genesis all the way back to the little ones and zeros machine that very, very few people understand you have to go down the stack from the high level the obvious the content back to it's like going from the movie screen to the stage production to the you know script to the myth that someone told around a, a fire 500 years ago the content in the content in the content in the content right that's uh that's turtles all the way down turtles all the <laughs> way down yep yeah <laughs> all right Clint, make sure in the the um, uh, description you put the link to your two videos, your um, media theorist and your history of computers. That would be great. Will do. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, great. Geez, thanks for, for talking. You really made me feel uh, appreciated, Jerry. God, it's, it's nice to have these kind of conversations. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, Clint. Have a good one. You too. Oh,